Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Foreman Community Demo 103. In case you're wondering, uh, yes, uh, that is a prime number. And it's also emergency phone numbers I learned in several countries, including India and Ukraine, I think. And I'm not Melanie, obviously. So uh, I'll be your host for today's demo. And uh, I'm LZIP, and I'll share some news in the Foreman community. So first up, we have ForminCon 2021. It's taking place online November 15th and 16th. Well, we had called for papers and it's over. And the good news is we have about two dozens of entries. So you know, I'm, I'm really glad that we have so many uh, interesting topics. And you'll hear more from Melanie, who is uh, organizing organizing this event. Next up, Formin 301 is out. Uh, we had a ugly memory spike uh, issue with memory, and uh, this was uh, mostly uh, for Puppet uh, Factor users or Facts users, so Ansible and Puppet Facts, so majority of our users, I, I say. Uh, and it's been fixed uh, and it's out. We also had some issues with Puppet and Discovery plugins, so these pl plugins were upgraded as well. There are new versions. Puppet extraction was a huge uh, effort. Uh, this was done by uh, Andre Ezer. Uh, good work right there. Kudos. And uh, he released a new version. And Discovery also uh, got a new release because um, the guy who maintains the Discovery, he forgot to you know, um, uh, catch the train with some uh, Puppet changes. And he, he you know, didn't do this in time. But, uh, you know, so 18.04 is the new update for Discovery for Formula 3.0. However, you know, the, the guy, the current maintainer, I think his name is Lukashi, he basically screwed it up and, you know, the Debian package arrived later. So as we speak, this, was, uh, this is already in, in nightlies and we'll be merging the update uh, into 3.0 repositories. So hopefully today we'll have we'll have a build and Debian users you know make sure that if you have uh, problems with Discovery and Puppet, uh, make sure you update the Discovery plugin, and uh, also make sure you run migrations as well. This will be bumped from 16 to 18 major release. You know, yeah, I I really apologize for Lukash. He's really I I, I don't think he's, he handles the real engineering well. But don't blame me. I'm just the messenger here. And uh, finally, the Foreman 3.1 RC1. That's the big question, the big announcement, right? So we had a delay, uh, a one week delay, but I'm happy to announce that we'll be releasing RC1 today. Yeah, we're actually, uh, actually, I haven't got confirmation, but people are working hard on getting this out. So it's going to be today or tomorrow. And somebody, you know, help me uh, if uh, we actually released the RC already, but uh, we are on track and we'll be doing this uh, right away. You know, I have this nice animation to celebrate this. Actually, I couldn't figure it out. So I'm just swapping the slides manually, but, you know, I think it's, it's also nice. And last thing before we can start with demos, that is, you know, with the RC1 release, we have uh, the guide uh, named Lukash. He, he usually goes uh, and creates uh, this entry in, on our forums. Uh, forum, forums. And uh, every time we push out RC release, uh, he comes up with this. It's called Test Week. It's basically a blog post with all the checkboxes and all the uh, workflows or use cases we would like to be tested, and we call for help. Uh, uh, so if you uh, want to tinker around, around with the RC release, you want to do, uh, well, let's say, an, uh, a testing upgrade, or uh, maybe you want to do a production upgrade uh, to RC release, you know, we do not uh, you know, suggest to do it, but you can do it. Uh, so. Go back to this page, search this uh, test week uh, keyword in our uh, discourse and and find the post. And every time you test something successfully, uh, tick the checkbox. We'll be very glad to see that. If we have any problems, please report Redmine issue. And uh, what's the best thing you can do is just drop a comment here. So because you know Redmine triage, it can take a while. It can 
take a day or two um, until it reaches the, the engineer. And if you drop a comment, we'll very quickly do um, some workaround for you or, or we'll, we'll start investigating right away. Now, last time uh, with the 3.0 release, and we had exactly zero contributors. So it was like a, the worst uh, test week ever. And so I thought that uh, I would do this like a little bit more interesting for people. So this post is actually created in 3D. So if you have uh, this cinema, you know, paper glasses and you, you go and read my blog post, uh, Lukas blog post, that's Lukas. Um, well, yeah, then, then uh, it should be more in interesting. So go ahead and try it. And with that, um, I would like to uh, give the word to the first presenter. Amir, but he, I think he called and he cannot make it. He's stuck somewhere in the Tel Aviv traffic. And I haven't been to Tel Aviv yet, but I think that's not going to be nice. So what I did was I'm um, actually, I set this up and I can present his work for him. So let me just quickly stop sharing. And let me just uh, share my tab right here. And you should see it coming up. And so this is all Amir's work. And the first feature he would like to show you is that uh, what you're looking at is the new host UI. You can turn on new host UI in settings. I'll show you that in a minute. Or also you can head over to the new UI from the old UI. There's a button, new UI, if you click on that. And so this is the work in progress. You know, as you can see, this page is experimental and under active development. Here is the, here's the warning box. And the first feature is if you the build button was implemented. So this is provisioning. So basically, a host can be in a build mode or non-build mode. And if you click on build, there's this uh, new uh, modal dialog implemented. As you can see, this host has some problems. Well, yeah, I haven't uh, associated it with a smart proxy. It's because I accidentally deleted my development database last week. Well whatever. Uh, so this this is the new uh, new feature, the dialogue here. Another one is uh, uh, also nice. That's a BMC. So I've quickly um, did uh, set up this host with a BMC fake uh, adapter. And I can actually click on the new button here. This is the drop down and another dialogue appears. And I can confirm and this host will be actually it's, you know, it tells it's being turned on, but actually it's not because uh, it's it's a fake BMC. Uh, does not nothing actually. And the last thing uh, Amar would like to show you is uh, in settings, and that's the one I mentioned. Uh, if you want to, you know, this is by default. Uh, the ho the new host UI is turned off by default right now. This is actually uh, nightly uh, what we're looking at. Then at some point we might uh, decide to turn this on, uh, so there will be a saving. And if you don't want to do that, you can still turn it off, or you can, uh, if you want to be early bird, just you know say yes here, and you can uh, turn it on. Uh, again, if you click on a host, you're still landing on the old page, but there is a, this new UI button uh, that's been implemented, I think, uh, last sprint, not this one which takes you to the whole new uh, host form. So this is what Amir uh, implemented. I'm just showing it this for him. The credit goes to Amir again. And if unless there are any issues or comments, I'm going to ensure. And with that, I'm going to uh, switch my screen. And the next one. Presenting is Ron, who will show you something about search bar and more uh, new UX, UX improvements. Over to you, Amir. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ron here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, let me start talking about the search bar. Uh, basically, this is an image of uh, our, our new, our older uh, search bar. Uh, it was also written using a uh, bootstrap styles uh, that the uh, pattern fly free uh, used. And now let's say basically pattern fly free was uh, the first try of uh, of this library to uh, to start the community. And, and I think the, the easiest way 
was to start with Bootstrap. But now, uh, Butterfly 4, which for me, it feels like uh, the first version. It's really designed uh, much more modern and basically Foreman uses most of their uh, components. So you can later search their site. It's butterfly react uh, dot uh, search or just Google it and you find it. So well, one of the issue we had uh, when really starting to redesign pages is that there are a lot of bootstrap and you can you don't know really where to start from because you don't want to touch the search bar when the table is is a bootstrap style and the buttons so it was ca kind of a loop where to start and we didn't do uh, all at once and it still feels like that we're a bit stuck uh, moving things so my goal basically was just to kick kickstart the, the change and this way we, we could use a uh, butterfly buttons and uh, switch to the to version 4 uh, more easily and now basically the search here uh, it wasn't totally replaced by a p4 um, because you know just was to move things but button here and uh, bookmarks is totally butterfly four. Uh, the search will switch, but we still want uh, community feedback and maybe to organize it uh, differently and add more so sort buttons here. But at least we we start this direction and this is also good. Now we can switch uh, to the table. I mean, it's not that bad, but you, you still feel that the difference in uh, in styles. Okay, I think I spoke enough about uh, the search bar. Yeah, but basically, I really wanted it to be part of the of my next topic <laughs> in the new uh, host insights tab. Let's go to the host page. And hopefully, again, when everything will be React, and uh, you will not wait uh, such a long time between page uh, transition. As Lucas sh showed, I also switched the setting uh, to the new details page. And here I'm going to show you about the Insights tab. Yeah. So. Basically, uh, you can connect your, you can upload your host uh, data to the um, Red Hat cloud if it's if it's a rel. And Red Hat has this service uh, to to show you some insights about your your host. Basically, in the overview, if you go to statuses, you can see inventory status uh, that your host was successfully uploaded. And of course, you need a subscription. And basically, when you trigger a Insight Sync, which I will show you next, uh, you will be able to to get all of this data. And there are a lot of uh, great fixes here. You can sort uh, by risk, for example. Uh, choose whatever you like. You can choose uh, one by one, or you can choose even one second, you can choose uh, like all of them. It's the same as in, uh, I think, in Gmail. You you can select uh, the current page. It tells you you selected nine, and then you can even select from all pages if you have, uh, hopefully you don't have too many insights and fixes to your host. And you can see that the selected ones are those that only have a playbook, so a fixable uh, solution. And then you can click Remediate. There will be a summary uh, of all the fixes and if reboot is required and what is exactly the resolution, uh, what, what's going to, to happen. Sometimes you even have multiple resolutions. So you can switch between them, decide which, uh, which solution uh, you would like. 
And basically, after you, this summary looks fine to you, you can click Remediate, and it will take you to the job invocation page. And now this is the, the current page, but just for you to know, is soon or next release, there will be a new job wizard, just showing you it. Uh, so it will look even better with more uh, capabilities. And yeah, that's basically it. And let me show you one more thing. Uh, basically, we also added the, hope, hope you can see it, in, in the search, in the uh, URL, you can add the, your custom search. So if from some page you would like to link uh, with a specific search here, like uh, total risk or uh, only a uh, playbook, something like, like that, you can directly link and the search will get filled here. Uh, and you can go to uh, the, the satellite insights page. Basically, they look uh, almost the same. In the host page, I just reused uh, this one. And you can see how fast uh, the tra transition between pages is. And, and yeah, and search, at least the search is not uh, bootstrap anymore and fit much better to, to all the, the rest of the new components. Uh, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, the new page is shaping up nicely indeed. And next up, uh, we have Andre Prajak, who will talk more about uh, Ansible new UI. I'm jumping in for a second, Andre, just to say, since we're not broadcasting today, but we do have people that joined live from IRC. So if anyone has a question, uh, you can raise your hand or put it in the chat if you'd like me to read it out. Go ahead, Andre. Thank you. Uh, you should be able to see my screen. Today, I'll be showing uh, new content on the new host detail page. Uh, I added a little bit of information regarding Ansible. So there is a, a Ansible tab, and it has various sub-tabs. Um, the first one is roles. So it provides information about Ansible roles, and it shows the roles that this host has assigned. So currently it has three roles and uh, it's possible to edit the assignment if you have the permissions. Right, so uh, the model window, uh, uh, window appears and it's possible uh, to add more and it's possible also to change the order of the roles. And, uh, that's it. Uh, it's also possible to view the roles that are inherited from host group. Um, this one, this host doesn't have any. So let me try this one. Yes. Uh, this one has uh, three roles inherited from host group. And uh, these will be executed before the roles that are assigned to hosts directly. So uh, that's pretty much all about the role stuff, uh, then uh, there are variables. And these are Ansible variables that are coming on, coming from the assigned roles, and they are uh, actually uh, marked to be over them. So uh, here you can see uh, the current value. You can see uh, the matcher, uh, which is applied. Uh, it's possible to update uh, the values. Uh, so let's change this one. Uh, and now uh, we can see that the matcher is actually on FQDM. And if we decide, we can delete it again. And uh, the value is now uh, default. Uh, that's pretty much it. And then there is uh, job uh, subtypes. And this is a way to quickly schedule a recurring uh, job that uh, plays all the Ansible roles. Uh, it's possible uh, to do this also from uh, the job invocation form. 
but this is like a, this is like a shortcut. Uh, so it will uh, allow you to create a job uh, which, uh, let's say, will run daily uh, at 3 a.m. and starting tomorrow. So once this gets created, we should see our, our job. And yeah, for some reason, this is taking a bit longer, but that's pretty much all I had. Thank you very much. I'll give it a second if anyone has any questions. So far, so good. We, on we the had art. a question for Rondo from before about mm -hmm. how to do the insight sync. Oh, yeah. Forgot to, to show it. One second. Uh, so basically, if you go to the insights page, you can go via this uh, kebab or from uh, config insights. And basically, the the admin the admin role can uh, set sync uh, automatically, and it will run uh, once a day if your host is uh, is connected and uploaded to to the added cloud, or you can trigger it uh, manually sync uh, recommendations and then you will get updates here i have some uh, mock data so I, I won't do it but uh, and hopefully no one will have too many insights usually i think it's up to 10 maximum hopefully uh, and to upload uh, uh, those to red Hat cloud inventory sorry about uh, the zoom here uh, you go to config inventory upload and here you you start uh, oh, click on that uh, start generate and it will upload it successfully to the cloud here you can see some logs uh, hope i answered the question thank you very much unless there are any more questions uh okay uh then the next up uh, we have dominic who Tell us more about the cron jobs for audit cleans up cleans up. Go ahead. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, I will share more my screen, and it's gonna be uh, much more screens, but you will you will, you will see it later. The first one is uh, the screen. Uh, I hope that you can see it. Uh, this is the normal screen of audits, so I can there by monitor and audits. And what's the audits are? Basically, it's just the node who, that means what user, uh, did something on some object. So there you can see that in the first row, you can see that the admin, so that was me, obviously, destroys some Ansible row that has the name testing because I test something. And we can see that the request to ID was something and so on, but uh, the audits can also hold uh, the change, uh, the updation of something. So you can see that uh, on this on this user that has the name something, in Czech it's a Pohlet test, but it's something, name, that the admin changed the roles uh, and password of this user from another password to, from one password to another, and uh, also change the roles that he has some default role and no facts role to the default role and we clone. And this is something like a version control basing, basically. But uh, it's really good for uh, for others uh, admins of the format because thanks to that we uh, the admin can see <clears throat> sorry can see what uh, what what user can do uh, did on the system. So, uh, however, uh, these uh, nodes could be really big because if you do a lot of things in in your system in your format, it makes a lot of a lot of uh, nodes. Uh, what user did? Uh, uh, anyway, uh, by the way, you can also specify what you can uh, record. Which changes do you want to record? I think. Uh, but if you are recording anything, uh, 
you can you can end up with really big database, and that's why uh, audits cleanup uh, rake task is there. Uh, this audits cleanup uh, task. Uh, let me share another screen. Right now, it's gonna be a, uh, it's gonna be a shell. So I hope you can see it. Uh, Yes, we can see. Thank you. Carry on. Right, right. Uh, you can you can see my shell, and uh, you can uh, until my until the cron job. You can just type if you want to free up the you if you want to free up the screen, uh, not screen but audits. Uh, you can just type something like this. So that means just uh, invoke the rake and wrote the correct task uh, so that means expire of audits so that means remove them and it removes them for uh, it removes every audits that were 90, 90 days older so it holds audits for 90 days before the day you are you are invoked it uh, also you can specify you could specify a day, so that means let's say I can say okay for me it's enough to have about two months, so fifty days roughly, of course. So you can type it, uh, but you but still you have to do it manually. So you need to go to the shell or prepare a prepare a task in Foreman, and on the specific host you need to perform this task, and uh, it's not good. So right now. Uh, uh, I can perform this task because uh, I have, and because I have the development uh, setup, I just take tape the tape the rake without foreman. And uh, right now, when I uh, run these tasks, uh, task, uh, it's end up with error, and I will say why. Well, this is just developer setup, so a lot of a lot of messages, they are important for the developer. But the last one is necessary for us because I got the message that uh, uh, the interval for keeping the audits is not defined in the settings. So my tasks task just exit, and that means that I don't define in the settings. In the settings, I didn't define a uh, amount of time for. What, how many days I want to keep in my in my audits? Uh, so I will change another screen. It's gonna be a window and audits again. Okay, I, it looks you can see it. And I will step to the settings. So administer and uh, path to the settings. And uh, in the in the top general, you can see the one of the latest settings, there is something like saved audits interval. Uh, it's a duration in days to preserve audits for, and you can leave it empty for to disable the audits cleanup. I leave it the empty value, so there is nothing. So the the task doesn't know how many how many days he needs to preserve. So it's it's better to exit this task, right? Because we don't want to anything to delete. But when I when I pick there some value, let's say 50 days, because for me it's enough. Uh, I will just save it. And uh, when you when you have a set when you upgrade the foreman to the newest version, uh, there is a definition of cron that's every day perform this task like the audits cleanup task and uh, it's uh, perform it and he just check it uh, how many days are in the database and if it's more than it's defined it just removes the uh, overflowing days but if you are set up it to the empty this task is will is will be still performed every day but it's also exists exists because there is no amount of time that we need to uh, that we need to preserve. We need to know to preserve. So that's all from me. 
and I hope you enjoyed my presentation. We totally enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Dominic. I followed the conversation right there. Uh, and you know, I have to say, if you if you ask a community, on business community, like pick a number, how many days do you want to you know expire tasks or tasks or audits? You know, it's really tough because everyone has an opinion. We have downstream, you know, satellite customers needs like more or maybe forever. Upstream users might not need so long periods of time. So it's always tough. So I think this is a reasonable uh, solution to the problem. Thank you very much. Once again, I don't see any uh, questions. Let me just quickly double check. OK, just pause, pause for you. And next up, we have Justin, who will update us with uh, a lot of Capello uh, UI stuff. Justin, over to you. Thanks, Sukash. Uh, should see my screen now. Um, so I think Ryan has been updating you in the past about Python support and generic content type support. And this is just a, an extension of that and adding a new feature to that. Uh, so you can see here, we have got a Python repository with 434 Python packages. And this is the new work that I've added is uh, these content types are now shown on the repo details page dynamically from the server. So there's no additional work that a developer has to do to make this show up. They just define a content type within a repository type, uh, it'll show up. And we can click on that and see all the information about the, uh, the package. And they can even uh, remove the content. And as I said, this sort of just shows up for new content types. So here's, for example, an OS tree repository that's using the same mechanisms. Um, and we can see that the OS tree ref shows up um, in the UI and they can interact with it in the same way. So the, the goal of this is to reduce the amount of effort required to add content types and make it more seamless and um, easy for developers to do. And that's it. Thank you very much. Speaking about OS3, I've just upgraded my uh, grandma-in-law's laptop from uh, CentOS 7 to Fedora uh, Silverblue and that uses OS3 as well. So that's interesting indeed. And James has more uh, information about OS3. So over to you. Uh, great. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, Justin kind of stole a little bit of the thunder there, but that's all right. Um, so like he was demonstrating uh, the support for displaying generic uh, content uh, types, and we've rebuilt the OS tree support in Catello uh, based on that. So let me go ahead and go over here, and I will show you creating an OS tree repo and syncing it. Um, We're still working on a couple of features for OS tree, like uploading OS tree archives uh, directly rather than just synchronizing from a URL. So the next demo hopefully will be showing that, but. Let's go ahead and create a new uh, repository. We can select OS tree type. And I'm going to sync this from a pulp fixture. So we'll go ahead and create that repository. And there it is. And we'll go ahead and sync it. OK, and you can see that it's, uh, it's good pulling down the artifacts and associating the uh, commit reps that are in that archive with this repository. And kind of like how uh, Justin was showing us before, you'll see the content type uh, counts being displayed. Uh, I don't think. I have Justin's update as far as the displaying of the types, but if you do look at the content breakdown, you will see the, instead of showing uh, a, a file name or file version, we're actually showing you the checksum for the commit refs. All right, so that's a real quick overview. Like I said, next time, hopefully we're gonna be able to demonstrate the upload feature and also uh, syncing OS tree content to external smart proxies. That was it. Thanks for that. Looking forward to see that. Um, next up, we have Samir, who also present for Andrew, who couldn't make it. So ton of updates. That's going to be a lot of features. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Lucas. So 
to read. Show my screen. So first up on the demo is the new Ansible Collections UI. So this is continuing on the work that Ryan did uh, to provide a generic framework for displaying content. So in a previous demo, he uh, demoed Python packages on the same framework. This is a continuation for that. And now we have moved Ansible Collections to that same UI. So as you can see, this is the new UI. This is Patternfly 4 based. And you can navigate inside to see the details. We have the repositories tab. So this is fairly similar to the uh, generic content page where we display Python. Yeah, and you also have a drop down option to get to Ansible collections from here. And this will display the same page, but if you go directly to the navigation, you won't see this uh, drop down to select types. And that's about it for this uh, page. Let's move on to the next part, which is so. Yeah, so this is a new uh, feature that has been added. Uh, so basically, when you try to delete a repository. Earlier, it used to give you an error, just saying that the repository is part of some published content views. Now we have added a list of the content views and the versions uh, that the repository has been published. In. So this should make uh, it easier to figure out where to remove that repository from if you want to delete it. And there's also another thing now this delete is a forced delete so it will actually go ahead and remove the repository from these versions and it will do a forced delete of that repository so you can still delete it and uh, see a list of where it will be removed from and all right moving on uh so first up i have uh this addition here, so content views basically are scoped uh, for an organization. So now if you don't select a specific organization and try to go to that tab, it will take you to the organization selector. And you'll need to select an organization to view the content views inside that organization. That's one addition. Uh, Moving on to things Andrew wanted to demo. So first up is this bookmarks. So here you can see some bookmarks that I have. So let's try this. And this will show you all the composite content views. You can also, let's say, create a new bookmark quickly. So if you do bookmark this search, it will auto-populate everything you need there you can save it and that will appear in your bookmarks uh next up is this so i hope you can see that uh the highlighting that's going on in the drop down items there was an issue where it was not actually highlighting any of these so now you can use your up and down arrows and whatever is going on. Uh, all right, that's one. And the other thing he wanted to demo was using middle clicks to open tabs in new pages. So you'll have to trust me that I'm clicking on the middle tab on the content views and it opens up in a new tab. So this was something that was missing. And that's about it. Thank you very much. And I'll just quickly check uh, if there are any questions. No questions so far, so good. The last but not least, William will show us uh, more information about uh, content proxy configuration. 
So I want to see that with them. Great, let me share my screen. Okay, um, so a brief introduction to this talk. Um, the title of the talk is Apache Configuration Changes for Content Proxy. And um, uh, as many of you know, we use different language upstream and downstream. Um, downstream, we refer to a capsule server. Uh, upstream, we usually call it proxy server or content proxy. Uh, and because the topic of this talk um, concerns the Apache uh, reverse proxy configuration, it would be confusing, I think, to say proxy, proxy, proxy all of the time and have it mean different things. So I'll ask your forgiveness. Uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to try to use uh, the language capsule server to uh, refer to the content proxy just to uh, avoid any potential confusion. So next, I want to talk briefly about um, what is the prior configuration here? So um, Capsule Server is uh, deployed with an Apache configuration called the Catello Reverse Proxy, which um, proxies the uh, single slash path. So essentially, uh, all requests starting with a slash to the Catello server uh, over port 8443. Um, in particular, that includes registration traffic over slash RHSM. And uh, this is actually different from the Catello primary server. So if you register a content host, whether you're using the Catello client bootstrap RPM or uh, whether you're using the newer global registration feature, um, whether you're configuring that server to register to Catello primary or register via a capsule, uh, will actually change the port uh, that the client is registered to communicate uh, to the RHSM API. And this is not so good. We'd like to have unity between um, the way clients are configured to register directly to Catello versus clients that are configured to register um, through a capsule. Now, one of the um, challenges here in this goal of reconfiguring capsules um, to register clients via port 443, there's a few challenges. One of them is that um, capsules already have an Apache virtual host on 443 for uh, pulp three, right? So if you communicate with capsule, send a request over 8443, uh, it gets reverse proxied to Catello, but if you communicate um, to a pulp API path over 443, then it goes to pulp, which is uh, local on the capsule server. So this really required some, some changes to the layout of the Apache configuration to accommodate both pulp and uh, RHSM registration traffic on 443. Um, a second challenge was that, um, as I mentioned previously, all uh, requests starting with the slash uh, would be reverse proxied in the prior configuration. And depending on who you are as a user and the nature of your deployment, this may be considered either a feature or a liability. So in, in what case would it be a feature Maybe you are um, on site in a data center uh, where you have a capsule server, but you don't have direct network access to the primary Catello server. In that case, you could still access uh, the Catello API or the web UI uh, by going through the capsule over 8443. However, that you know is not um, typical for all users. It's sort of more of an edge case. Um, so probably most users do not desire that configuration. Um, so one of the interesting problems to solve uh, in changing this configuration was um, allowing users who still desire that 
proxying behavior to uh, opt into it long term. And then finally, uh, another challenge is what about content hosts which are already registered? So they've uh, already been configured to use 8443. Uh, and if we simply changed it over to 443, uh, now they can't get their latest uh, registration and subscription status. Um, so the route we've gone with this is um, to preserve the existing behavior for now. So there's still the um, complete reverse proxy on 8443 by default. Um, and we've added a new Apache configuration for a virtual host on port 443, um, which will send RHSM traffic to the Catello primary server. And uh, we've moved the pulp3 configuration uh, from the pulp virtual host um, now into this shared RHSM pulp virtual host. And I can show you what this looks like. Um, so if we go to this proxy server here, this is just a forklift environment, um, which I'm using to test these changes. Uh, because this is running on forklift and libvirt, uh, all locally on my laptop, it may be a little bit slow to connect here. So I'll ask you to bear with me for just a moment. Take a sip of my tea while we're waiting. Jeopardy theme music plays, here we go. So um, this is the new default configuration for Apache on the capsule server. Uh, you'll notice there's still a, um, a pulp three Apache configuration here. This is for uh, HTTP traffic, uh, not for HTTPS over 443. So uh, another change you'll notice is that um, we have something called uh, RHSM pulp core HTTPS 8443. This is the, um, the old Catello reverse proxy uh, Apache configuration. It's just been uh, renamed uh, to be slightly less confusing. And um, so that also means if you're, say, looking for logs, um, I think in here, Right, uh, where you'd previously look and say, uh, Catello reverse proxy, uh, error SSL.log or access SSL.log, uh, that's simply been renamed to RHSM pulp core HTTPS uh, 8443. Now, um, the primary change here is the introduction of the new Apache configuration uh, for port 443, and this is the one which is going to remain enabled by default going forward. So at this time, we have both uh, in order to solve the problem of clients that have already been registered and configured to use 8443, uh, but it will be necessary to reconfigure those um, to use 443, essentially re-register, uh, either regenerate the registration command or um, install the new Catello client uh, bootstrap RPM and use 443 uh, in the future because in the future, uh, the behavior will be that the 8443 Apache configuration will be disabled by default. Um, so I want to show just a few more things um, and I'm actually going to uh, change over to my sharing my web browser for this.
So, okay, just to show you here. Um, let's see, this is just to, to prove that there's there's no tricks involved here. Uh, hello, server, nightly, CentOS 7. It's a, little bit tall. It's, it's a little bit tall, the browser. So hopefully we can maybe, maybe if you can make it bigger. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. OK. Let so. me just uh, move it. OK. That, to a different yeah, different monitor. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so here uh, you can see that I have the primary Catello server. I'm accessing the web UI. Uh, and I've already um, told Firefox to ignore the fact that I haven't accepted this certificate, right? Um, however, if instead we go to, you can see the URL here is different. This is my capsule server, pipe Catello proxy nightly. And, um, and you can see also I'm accessing this over 8443. So if I refresh, uh, you'll see I have not accepted the certificate for this site, but if I do, uh, this, I accepted one, but not not the other to prove to you that there's no magic here. It's truly two different sites. I accept the risk and continue. And uh, here we are. It's uh, my same form and server, but now I'm accessing it through the um, through the capsule. And uh, I want to emphasize this is already the case. This is uh, the existing configuration, but it may not be desired. Uh, going forward. And so going forward, this will be disabled, but you'll be able to opt back into it. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to show you is uh, what happens if you, let's say you want to go ahead and make the change. You already have, say, uh, remote execution or Ansible configured or, or Puppet, some method to easily take your 1,000 content hosts and reconfigure all of them uh, to register over and communicate to the RHSM API over port 443. And you don't want this 8443 proxying, and you don't want to wait for us to disable it by default. You want to disable it today. Well, it's, it's very easy to do. So I'll share my terminal again. Um, OK, so um, what we're looking at up here, uh, oops, like I said, this is um, I'm using Forklift and Vagrant to uh, run test pipelines and uh, confirm that in multiple different configuration scenarios uh, that these Apache configurations are working as expected. And you can still run all of your content workloads. You can, um, you know, so we're, we're running a test pipeline uh, that ensures that we're not breaking any features by making this change. Um, and uh, I'm editing some Ansible variables to um, supply um, additional configuration options to the Foreman installer. Uh, and in fact, you can see that uh, this is the default configuration for this pipeline, which is what we're actually used uh, in the current uh, VMs that I have built, but um, you can see here commented out is another uh, version that I've worked with, and this is using um, the additional configuration Foreman proxy content reverse proxy port 443 uh, in the case where for the capsule server only because this doesn't um, apply to the Catello server and. This is an option that already exists. And uh, you know, if you're not aware of it, probably you're just using the default, which would be the default value of 8443. But um, we actually wrote the installer and puppet code such that if you change the port for the existing uh, Catello reverse proxy that proxies all traffic, uh, if you change that over to uh, use port 443, then it will um, create only the single configuration for Apache, and it will attach the 
the pulp configuration fragments there. Um, so if you if you want to use only 443 today, you've already reconfigured your content host to use 443, uh, you can simply make this change on your capsule server and it will work. And then in the future, um, the change will be that the proxying of the slash path uh, on 8443 will be disabled and 443 will be all that is there by default. So uh, thanks for attending the talk today. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let us know via the chat. Thank you. So I'm not gonna lie, this is not easy. And you know, and hosting is not, not easy while I was trying to you know, monitor all the chats and stuff. I lost the thread, but there is a question by Evgeny or men mention. So I, I'm gonna ask him if you could um, uh, articulate that. I'm not sure about this one. Uh, sure. So you mentioned that one should re-register the, the client to get the new configuration, but essentially the only thing that you really need to do is to change the port in the configuration of subscription managers. So uh, you could also do this manually or via your automation, like Ansible Puppet whatsoever. So there is you don't need to perform the whole registration um, procedure. That's what I was aiming at. So, is sure, that correct? sure. That's yeah. That's a that's a great point. Um, I think uh, rhsm.conf is the the source of all truth for uh, registration. Um, so um, yeah, you could simply use sed and replace eight four four three with with four four three, uh, or you could reinstall the um, the bootstrap uh, rpm uh, edits that configuration file, or um, I think the the global registration command that you would generate from the template also would uh, set up the configuration there, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you just wanted to directly edit the configuration file on the content host to use um, 443 and, and 8443 instead of 8443, then you could do it that way as well. Uh, and it's important to do this because in the future, like I said, um, we're going to disable 8443 by default. It will no longer work. So existing content hosts will need to be reconfigured to use only 443. Yeah. It's a great point. Thanks at the beginning. Thank you very much. Um, we still have one more thing on our agenda, which has been added uh, recently, moments ago. But I uh, want, there's one more question, because this, not, this is not going to be recorded. I'm going to ask Samir, and I, I'll, I'll read it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if Genny has to go, so if we oh. can just okay, give sure. the floor for a moment, and sure. then absolutely. I, I was told that Evgeny has an announcement, so go ahead. Mike is yours. Thanks. Yeah, announcement is rather short. We just released a uh, Foreman Ansible modules version 3.0, which obviously everybody should update to and use. Please, please do so. It's a 3.0 instead of 2.1 something because there are two breaking changes in, the, uh, in this release. Uh, the breaking change number one is it's stopped supporting Ansible 2.8, or at least we start testing on Ansible 2.8. It probably still works, but nobody will guarantee it for you. And the second change is more interesting. It was done by Kenny from, from our um, support team and it's finally switching over to using the uh, reports API for the inventory, which is much faster, but also um, returns slightly different results than uh, querying the API directly for each host. So try it out and uh, see if that works for you. Great. You can still revert to the old uh, to the old API, but but yeah, the new one is better. So use it, please. And another change that is in, which is not breaking, but still worth mentioning, is there is now a convert to rel role, which will set up your Catello in a way that you can drop CentOS and Oracle Linux machines into a host group and essentially press a button and they will be converted to an equivalent rel installation. And with that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Evgeny. There's actually one more hidden you know, feature in that release. I'm looking forward to the release and testing it out. That is uh, Foreman Reports. It's a new plugin it will be showing you with the release uh, 3.1, maybe later, maybe uh, the next demo. All right, uh, thank you very much. And uh, before I wrap up, um, uh, there's this question for Samir. So I, I'd like to ask you to reply as I read it. As you show, the force deletion of the repo doesn't remove CV slash CCV versions as well. Uh, yeah. So when you delete the repository, the repository itself is removed from the version and the content view, but it the content view and the version itself are not deleted. They remain intact. All right. Um, thank you. We're in, at the top of the hour. It's been exactly one hour. And so I'm going to wrap up. Um, unless there are any other questions or comments, speak up right now. Um, and I, I'll take a moment to um, thank you all. You know, it's it's a pleasure to work with the Formal community. You know, we are, we are friendly, you know, and great community uh, of passionate people. And I'm, I'm really happy to be part of it. And also, I'm not seeing some faces on the demo. Uh, it's because I know we're, while I, we're, we're doing this demo, people are working hard on getting the RC1 out. I have information that it should be done by today or maybe tomorrow. So you know, while if you're watching this from the recording, and I, I won't name you all because I would probably forget somebody. Thank you all for your hard work on getting those releases out. I tried this once. I think if you remember, that was the release that I, and we didn't have a RPM package signed because I forgot. Um, so yeah, it's not easy. It's a terribly you know complicated process. So thank you for doing that. And with that, um, thank you very much. And uh, Melanie will uh, you know host the next demo. Thank you. Where's the stop recording button? <laughs> I can't find it. Oh, here. Okay, I have it. Cheers. <laughs>